o'clock news starts right now. Yeah, and off the top at six, we continue to monitor a possible accident involving a school bus. We first showed you at five o'clock, but this is Transguide right now at Loop 410 and Jackson Keller, and you can see the scene has been cleared. Still very heavy traffic, but it is all clear now. The bus was just taken away within the last few minutes. Yeah, that's some good news. Let's take a look at what it looked like at five o'clock, though. There was a car sideways in front of that bus. Again, this is an earlier look at 410 and Jackson Keller. We emailed both North Side ISD and Northeast ISD. Both districts told us they are not aware of any of their buses being involved in a crash. We're trying to get some more information and we'll get you updated as soon as we get that information. But it did appear based on the response we saw that it didn't look like a lot of kids were on the bus, if at all. We didn't see anyone come off of that bus. But again, the all clear has been given at 410 and Jackson Keller now. The San Antonio Fire Union took a big swing today, asking for what amounts to a 37 and a half percent raise over three years. That's much larger than what the city offered last week as the two sides began trying to negotiate a new contract. Garrett Berger at both negotiations negotiating sessions. He joins us live. Garrett, the city and the fire union, they have a tumultuous history. Are we headed for another extended battle or for lack of a better word, a firefight? Well, Steve, it's too soon to say. Right now, both sides at the negotiating table still being pretty cordial. But as you mentioned, tumultuous history there. And with, the, with that enormous gap in what is the firefighter's biggest issue, base pay, we're going to have to see. So quick comparison on what they're asking for. The city wants a five-year contract. Well, the union wants it in three. And firefighters are hoping for much steeper pay increases during that time. But between the pay increases and other proposals they put forward, the city says they can't afford what the union's asking for. According to the city's math, the fire union's proposals would cost hundreds of millions more in a shorter time frame. Pay makes up about half of what you see there on your screen for the fire union's number. But with pay as the bottom line and this giant gap between the salary proposals, where does that leave them? We feel we have a very, very strong proposal. We've never made a proposal that is uh, as strong as we have made. Uh, we, we're not going to make a lot of movement from where we are today. So we're sitting across from experts, but we're also experts. Uh, we're experts in what we do. And we know that we're being overheated and overworked. And we know that our members are communicating that they feel underwhelmed by this offer. Now, the fire union is looking to make up for lost ground over the past decade between an extended fight with the city that kept wages frozen for years and a lackluster deal once one was finally forced on both sides. They've seen inflation rise at nearly triple the rate their base salary has. Now, while both sides say they are not here to relitigate the past, it's obviously hanging over these negotiations. Now, new leadership at both the city and the union has helped ease some of those historic tensions, and they've had a little bit of time to repair that relationship. But now, as they get into the nitty gritty of the contract, we're going to see that new relationship get stress tested. Live downtown, I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. And we'll continue to follow it. Thank you, Garrett. Well, it's been a month since 21 year old Caleb Harris has been reported missing and his family and Corpus Christi police still have no answers on where he is or what might have happened. And they are trying to find those tonight. There are dual vigils happening for Harris, one in Corpus Christi where he disappeared and then one in New Broadfalls where he's from. Our John Paul Barajas joins us from there. The vigil here at Atlanta Park is going to get underway shortly, but the setup process is still going on. But the people that we have spoken to described Caleb as a good kid who loved to fish and frankly just liked to be at home. And that's what tonight's all about is trying to get Caleb back home. According to Corpus Christi Police, the last time Harris was seen was around 2.20 in the morning, March 4th, at his off-campus apartment on the 1900 block of Ennis Jocelyn Road in Corpus. Harris is a student at Texas A&M Corpus Christi. Police say his roommates told Harris they were going to sleep. Harris then said he was going to stay up to order Uber Eats for a school lunch later that day. At 3.03, he sent a friend a picture of a small bridge over a drainage ditch just a few hundred feet from his complex. By 312, his phone was turned off and no one has heard from him or seen him since. The Harris family is now offering a $50,000 reward for any information that leads to Caleb. And tonight at 10, we'll be hearing from Caleb's parents on how they're holding up and what's next for them. John Paul Barajas, KSAT, 
12 News. Tonight, a member of the Texas National Guard is facing human smuggling charges after he was arrested following a high-speed chase in Kenny County. That arrest happened this past Sunday. This is dash cam video from that arrest. A spokesperson for Kenny County identified the National Guardsman as Savian Johnson. According to Sheriff Brad Coe, Johnson led law enforcement on a chase after speeding away from a border checkpoint. Now, at some point during that chase, Johnson stopped and a person believed to be a migrant got out of the car and ran. Johnson then continued driving, but law enforcement was able to stop him using spike strips. And people who live near the area where a mother and her five year old son were hit by a car and killed say they want something done about reckless drivers there. We first told you about this as breaking news on the night beat last night. San Antonio police say the driver who hit and killed 39 year old Vanessa Ramos and her son Solomon Lopez last night was intoxicated. Ramos pushing her son in a stroller not far from their home at the time on Stone Oak Parkway west of Highway 281. Neighbors say the street is a regular speeding zone. So they always go fast. We hear the motors like every day coming down Stona Parkway. So hopefully after all this, we'll start getting some more patrols. That neighbor who didn't want to show his face says he heard the horrific crash from his home. Police have arrested the driver, 56 year old Marlon Daniels on charges of intoxication manslaughter. To the courthouse now in a Houston man charged with murder here in San Antonio saying it was all done in self-defense. Tavares Anderson accused of fatally shooting a 26 year old man back in 2021. This trial started on Tuesday and tonight Erica Hernandez brings us the eyewitness testimony that contradicts the defense's case. Never put his hands on him, didn't have any weapons on him. Terika Henderson explaining to a jury earlier this week the night her cousin Malcolm Ray Everett was allegedly shot and killed by her friend Tavares Anderson. Anderson from Houston and Henderson were casually dating at the time. On July 18, 2021, he came to visit her and they, along with Everett and his girlfriend, were drinking at a local bar. When they got back to Henderson's apartment, she says things escalated and her and Anderson got into an argument and she tried to get him to leave. The argument continued into the parking lot of her apartment complex and that is when her cousin tried to get Anderson to leave as well. We pointed to the door several times telling him to leave and he stayed there and kept talking and talking and keep trying to explain himself or trying to justify why he was acting the way that he was acting. While standing next to both of them, Henderson says at some point Anderson took out his handgun and before she knew, he fired a shot. I thought that he had shot me um, because I was just so close to him. Um, but then I turned around and then I realized uh, Ray's eyes were like flickering, but he was still standing. And then that's when I realized that he was the one that was hit. Everett was hit once in the chest at close range, the bullet piercing his heart and aorta, causing his death. The defense, though, saying that Everett and Henderson were the aggressors, that Anderson was trying to back away and feared Everett was going to attack him. Ultimately, it's up to the jury to decide if Anderson will be guilty or not guilty. And those deliberations could happen as early as tomorrow. If found guilty, Anderson faces up to life in prison. At the Gathena Reeves Justice Center, Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. All right, take a look at these little guys. Have you seen these around town yet? Today is reveal day for the Cardboard Kids campaign by the local nonprofit Child Safe. And parents, this could be a tool for you. Here's why. This campaign started 10 years ago to raise awareness of child abuse, which is a huge problem in Bear County. But it's evolved into a prevention tool, a way for parents to start a really difficult conversation with their kids in an easier way, to let them know what abuse is, what's safe, and what's not. What this does is it's an art project, and so it kind of lightens the mood, and you can have that conversation while you're coloring or you're explaining exactly what this project is for. Most importantly, I think the biggest piece that I see from this year over year is we wind up actually getting about three or four outcries of child abuse as a result of individuals doing these with children. 
These cardboard kids were distributed last month. Families, kids, companies had a few weeks to decorate, and now they're on display. So if you see the cardboard kids around town, snap a picture, share it, and use the hashtag CardboardKidsSA. We are counting down the days until the total solar eclipse. Our KSED weather team is helping you get ready for it with a free pair of eclipse glasses. Let's go live out to Mission County Park where meteorologist Mike Osterhage, Justin Horn are hosting our latest glasses giveaway. Hey guys. How are you? Yeah, we're at, uh, we're at Metro Health yep. Public Health Fest. It's a big deal out here. We've had a lot of folks come through. And it's been a really fun event. Oh my gosh! Uh, you know, and there are hundreds and hundreds of people were out here and taking pictures of everybody. So many great, great folks that love watching Casehead and everything else. And it's first of all, we got to do a little bragging for the city because we do. it is events like this, and everything has been free here, and a gold medal. City Health Gold Medal for Improving Health Through Policy. Only one in seven cities in the country and the only one in the state of Texas. Pretty incredible, pretty incredible. And we've been able to hand out solar eclipse glasses, yes. which is part of public health too. We got to protect your eyes. Exactly. All right, ready? Glasses! All right, and now, selfie! selfie. Get your phones. <laughs> Put it together, yeah! <laughs> a lot of wonderful folks out here. Don't forget, we have another glasses giveaway coming up tomorrow. Caskey's going to yes, be out there. Yeah, Adam's going to be at Ikea, I believe, yep. tomorrow uh, tomorrow afternoon. So if you haven't got your glasses yet, you got you got to have them for the Eclipse. You'll want to have them, and we're giving them out free. And uh, thanks to everyone yes. that came out today. Yay, give yourselves a round of applause. And, of course, a lot of folks have been asking about Fiesta Metals, because once we get past Monday, it's all Fiesta, and we'll be announcing Fiesta Metal giveaways as well. But, boy, it has been great out here. Thank you for having us, everybody. Back to you guys. Yeah, this is kind of a warm-up for Fiesta Metal giveaways. Yeah. <laughs> we got a lot going on around here. This, and Mike and Justin know how to work a crowd. <laughs> you notice that? Oh, yeah. And, you know, speaking of Fiesta Metals, next Thursday I'll be uh -huh. unveiling mine live with my friends from Cowboys Heating and Air Conditioning. Okay. Love and it. And the giveaway is next Friday, the, the day after. Yeah, it, it's crazy. Hey, that time of year. It's all, like, April's coming at us. Mm -hmm. <sighs> all right. Let's just talk about this big temperature spread today. We rose nearly 40 degrees from our low, morning low of 49 to the afternoon high of 88. Right now we're 88 in Castroville, 86 officially at the airport in town, Converse 86, 82 Bernie and 86 in Comfort. Temperatures falling off quickly though this evening, near average, seasonable, but will be upper 70s by 8 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 72, low humidity and comfortable tomorrow morning. We'll be 53 in San Antonio, a little bit closer to 50 as you get outside of town, especially into the hill country. Beautiful out there right now. We've got the clear skies, good for the outdoor events, Valero, Texas open. However, we are expecting some noticeable changes as we get into this upcoming weekend, and that's going to not only be visible, but you'll feel it as well. We'll talk about how that's going to impact some of the events uh, coming right up, along with the updated Eclipse forecast. All right, thanks, Adam. Still ahead here on the News at 6, we've talked about the number of scientists who will be in the Alamo City for Monday's eclipse. Well, after the break, hear from one of those scientists who is using the eclipse to research whether there's other life out there in our universe. The amount of scientists that will be showing up to San Antonio to view this eclipse will be a lot. There will be a lot of them. All <laughs> kinds of science surrounding this eclipse will be studied. Yeah, tonight meteorologist Justin Horn caught up with one of those scientists who's had a 34 year career at NASA and is using the eclipse to study the age old question. Are we alone in the universe? The eclipse and science itself are on a collision course to truly break open the secrets of the universe. Rapid advancement has brought us to a point where sci fi is becoming reality. For the very first time in a period in our in humanity, we are finally at a point where we can answer the question, are we alone in the universe? Amazingly, technology is reaching a place where we can answer the question once and for all. That technology is in the form of what's being called the Habitable Worlds Observatory, a future NASA project. It's a telescope like its predecessors, Hubble and James Webb, but with even more ability to look closer and even farther into the depths of our universe. We have eight, some people argue, nine planets in our solar system. And, and so is that unique? Is that 
you know, is that rare or is that common? How many? And so we want to go look at other solar systems and look at really hundreds of other planets and look at their chemical composition and then truly try to look at the, I like to call it the zoology of planets. Crook will be in San Antonio for the eclipse, not only because it's science at work, but because it plays into her research. She's collaborating with Dr. Chris Packham, professor of physics and astronomy at UTSA. Because the moon goes in front of the sun as we see it, we can see the faint kind of something like the atmosphere of the sun. We, although it's there all the time, we can't see it because of the dazzling brightness of the sun. It's similar with these uh, uh, planets around these distant stars, right? The, we can't see those planets because the stars are very bright. So the Habitable Worlds Observatory will kind of make like a, an artificial eclipse. But the only way to do, do that is to do exactly what Chris just said. You've got a bright star that's 10 billion times brighter than the reflected light you're trying to see from the planet. And that you have to block out that starlight. Allowing them to see things like the atmospheres of planets outside of our solar system. It's fascinating science that they hope the eclipse will help with. But they also want to share their love of space with all the young, budding scientists who will be joining them to view the eclipse. We ask a question, we build a mission to go find that answer, and it gives us that answer, but it begs us to ask even more questions. Like Justin Horn, KSAT 12 News. Are we alone? If you want to see all of our stories leading up to the eclipse, just scan this QR code on your screen. It'll take you to our Eclipse Authority page on KSAT.com. All kinds of different angles to this eclipse, but the forecast is the big one. Well We're put. Wandering on angles. Angles. Yeah. I yeah. Know. Well put. I'm okay. giving you a compliment. All right. Thanks. I know you're not used to it. It doesn't just, happen often, but just you making know. sure there's not like a pun I missed. <laughs> or I was angles thinking too, is like, a pun. What That's did I the miss? pun. Was it the colander joke? If I view the eclipse through a colander, will it strain my eyes? Oh. Uh, Thanks, Johnny. Thank you, Johnny. I like that one. Johnny on our crew. Johnny and there's Ponce. the haircut one. Got you that know. from him. What's the haircut one? What is oh, this? You gave it away. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, well, I say, how does an astronaut cut his hair? Oh. oh. Eclipse it. Eclipse it. Yeah, I was going to say, right. how does the sun cut his yeah. hair? Oh, yeah, I like the astronaut oh. personally. <laughs> You're, but it's, it's, no colander, it's no colander just... joke. All right, we're losing viewers right now. Let's uh, get right to the weather. <laughs> <laughs> Sunny and warm again tomorrow. Saturday, cloudy with morning fog and drizzle. Not ideal for the Valero Texas Open, but especially not ideal for the air show at JBSA Randolph. And then the all important eclipse cloud cover forecast coming right up. Let's get to tomorrow first. 53 in the morning. I did mention earlier into the hill country, a little closer to 50 degrees at sunrise than sunny by noon near 80. Mid 80s for a high temperature. 85 here in town, a southeast wind at 10 to 20. So that southeasterly wind will increase the humidity a bit tomorrow. We'll be well into the 80s all across the board, but then Saturday is going to be a little bit cooler because of the low clouds. And speaking of low clouds, I did mention the morning fog and drizzle. It's going to take a while for that low ceiling to lift, and I don't really see it lifting much until we get into the early afternoon hours and then just a mainly gray day. And I mentioned the ceilings because that impacts, of course, uh, potential flights with the air show. But Sunday is going to be the better day. A few showers possible Saturday night, but otherwise sunny, low humidity and mid 80s on Sunday. More of what we've been experiencing. We get into Monday, some storms possible after the eclipse, 30% chance. And then another shot of some scattered activity here Tuesday evening through Tuesday night and on into Wednesday morning. We'll have fairly unstable atmosphere here that whole time, so there's a chance for some strong to severe storms. Something to consider if you're out camping for the eclipse and you plan on staying in position afterwards, just be sure to have a shelter or a vehicle you can take, uh, you can seek shelter in. All right, let's get to the eclipse forecast. We're keeping it at 60% chance of it being visible, but between or through the clouds, and a 40% chance of it being completely blocked and basically worst case scenario. I'm honestly a little more opt more optimistic than this right now, but I need more data before I change those numbers and go with it. Look at this swirl here near California. That swirl is going to bring the pre-eclipse cold front through on Saturday night. This swirl we're watching up in Alaska, see a lot needs, a lot is coming together, is going to bring the high thin cirrus clouds. 
So watch as our pattern evolves going through time. System one brings the cold front. System two sets us up with this southwesterly flow aloft. That's upper level winds coming off the Pacific, which almost always guarantee high thin clouds. The question is those clouds, how layered are they going to be? So how translucent are they going to be? These are the ones that, you know, you can see that little halo that ring around the sun sometimes those types of clouds. We'll have more details on that, of course, as we get into the weekend. The other factor here, humidity pushed away for Sunday, but then that cold front washes out and that allows the humidity to surge back into place Sunday night. We see this pattern often that leads to low gray overcast mornings. Those low gray thick stratus clouds. The other wild card is how long is it going to take for those to clear? Typically, it's any time from mid morning to early afternoon. We'll have a more fine tuned forecast on that by this weekend, but I am optimistic that the, most of those low clouds will clear out by the late morning and help favor us just from what I'm seeing, but we'll keep you updated and keep you posted. All right. Thank you, Adam. All right. The Spurs back in action this week and they, they're, they have a series of games where they're playing teams that are trying to get in playoff position, Larry. Yeah, and Zach Collins talked about that this morning at Spurs Shootaround. He says it's something that the Spurs really need as they get ready for next season, kind of like a measuring stick sort of a game. And we are live from the Valero Texas Open where they had a big crowd today coming up. So you do have 10 seconds by the time you get to the vicinity of the ball. So the clock is running right now. So we'll give you an exact second here. They score. So it's just under the 10 second rule. Roy McElroy was all smiles after the win helped his birdie putt drop on a hole number eight today at the Valero Texas Open and Big Board Sports. Zach Collins and the Spurs are in New Orleans to take on the Pelicans tomorrow night. The Pels lead the season series three games to none and will go for the sweep. New Orleans is fighting for a playoff spot. Right now they're seventh in the West and currently in the play-in tournament. Facing playoff teams is a good thing, says Zach Collins, who spoke at morning shoot-around. It's good against these playoff teams, man, to see what playoff teams are like, see how they, you know, how they go through ebbs and flows of the games, how they carry themselves, um, especially Denver. They've, they've won they've won it all. You know, they have the blueprint. So being around that and, and understanding how, how much it takes to win in this league, uh, it's good for us to see. The Pels will host the Spurs tomorrow night at 7 at the Smoothie King Center. There was a nice crowd at the Valero Texas Open today for the first round. And that group right there is following the threesome of Rory McIlroy, Ricky Fowler, and Tommy Fleetwood. Rory went three under 69 today. Fleetwood was even par and Fowler plus five. Now this is going down at TPC San Antonio, the Oaks course. And that's where Mary Rominger is live along with Photog Mark Mendez as they cover the first round of the VTO. Mary. We've seen some great golf today, Larry, and despite the windy conditions, there have been many highlight worthy moments, including some dramatic putts like we saw from Roy McElroy on hole eight. Another putt worthy of the dramatics was on hole nine. Max Homa ended his day four under with this 39 foot two inch putt for birdie. Surprisingly, a lot of golfers struggled on that hole, but not the Valencia, California native who finds himself tied for third on the leaderboard. Meanwhile, Justin Lauer held the lead for most of the day at six under, making for a pretty special birthday and start to San Antonio's PGA tournament. So this one uh, hadn't been here in a while, but uh, it's a course I've liked uh, this, you know, city and hotel is amazing, especially with the family. So it's a no brainer uh, to add this one and, and try to change up how I've kind of prepared for the majors, especially the masters. It just basically just back to the short game and everything. It can really save you around a place like this. And uh, luckily the rough isn't too penalizing. If it was, I mean, if it was five inches everywhere, I mean, I, I don't think we'd finish probably uh, with the wind and everything, but uh, my short game's been great. My putting's finally starting to come around. Hopefully it continues that, that trend. And uh, yeah, I'm extremely proud of the round. 
And Lauer six under par again led for most of the day until Akshay Bhatia got started. Bhatia is on hole 18 and he is eight under par. And not too long ago, Jordan Spieth got a hole in one on hole 16. TPC San Antonio erupted. Spieth used his seven iron from 199 yards out, Larry. Thank you, Mary. We will have that hole in one for you tonight on the night beat. Pretty awesome. Big crowd yelling, I'm sure, for the local favorite anyway. Indeed. Yeah, yeah. thanks, Larry. Doc Talk is coming up next. It is time now for Doc Talk. We take your medical questions and get answers with local doctors. Today we are joined by Dr. Amy Cobb from University Health. Thanks for being here. My pleasure. Good our, to have you back. Yeah, yeah. no, it's been yeah. a while. Yeah. Okay, so our first question comes to us from Raul. He is asking, what are the latest recommendations regarding COVID vaccines for the elderly? I'm around my 84-year-old mother a lot. Is it a good idea for my mother and me to get vaccinated again? So in the fall of 2023, they did update the COVID vaccine. And basically it's to target the XBB lineage of the Omicron variant. So it's just the most up to date for what's circulating right now. So for anyone over the age of 65, like his mother, it would be recommended to get two doses of the updated 2023, 2024 version, four months apart. So two doses, four months apart. Now, if Raul is under the age of 65, he would also be recommended to get a vaccine, but he would only need one. Interesting. Okay. All right. So atorvastatin is used for high cholesterol. And the next question is, I take atorvastatin, but my muscles have gotten very weak. I'm told I can't take anything else as I have two stents, one in each leg. Is there anything else that will help my cholesterol? And I think weak is spelled wrong on there, but you know, take yeah. W-E-A-K. Right. So as you said, atorvastatin is in a class of medications. They're called statins and they're mm -hmm. for cholesterol and they're highly effective and usually safe. They've been used by cardiologists and primary care doctors for many years. But in about two to 11% of patients, they can get a muscle side effect where they might have pain or weakness and so forth. Only 0.2 to 0.5% have a serious muscle reaction where it's so severe that the muscle breakdown can damage the kidney, for example, or cause serious muscle damage. So the first step would be to stop the medication until the symptoms go away completely. And then I would recommend talking to your doctor and seeing if there's another medicine you're on that might be making you more likely to react to the statin. So for example, there's a, a class of medicines called fibrates or niacin that can make the statin more likely to give you that kind of reaction. You should also be screened for some other conditions that can damage the muscle like thyroid disease, kidney disease, um, obstructive liver disease, and even vitamin D deficiency. Sometimes if you treat those conditions and then you restart the statin, you can tolerate it better. Statins are broken down into high intensity, moderate, and low, and sometimes you can go back on the medicine just to step down a little bit weaker, and then you can tolerate it. And I've also seen some people that if they take it every other day, they can still get benefit and they're able to tolerate it better. Now, if he is in that group that had a serious reaction, there is another, there are several other classes of medications that can be effective. So azetamibe is one, and that one is like a blocker of cholesterol absorption. Mm -hmm. There are several others. There's even an injection that you can get from your cardiologist. Um, so the next step, just talk to your doctor, see if any of those options would work for you. Great. Okay. Our next question is, I have a friend who was diagnosed with B-cell lymphoma. That's what this viewer wrote to us, asking what kind of cancer is it and is it treatable? What are symptoms to look for? So lymphoma is a disease or a cancer of the lymphatic system, which I think of as like the germ fighting network in your body. It includes your lymph nodes, your thymus, your spleen, and your bone marrow. B-cell lymphoma is one type of lymphoma. It come, B cells are uh, immune cell that help produce antibodies. And so symptoms of B-cell lymphoma can be things like weight loss, drenching night sweats, fevers, um, and enlarged lymph nodes. So you might notice a gland that's very large. And then you, know, you would go to your doctor, get some blood work, maybe a, a chest x-ray, CT scanner, biopsy. The treatment is usually chemotherapy, several rounds of chemotherapy. In some cases, they might need radiation or um, even a bone marrow transplant. But for this viewer who's concerned about their friend, what I, what I would suggest is if they're open to it, offer if you can go with the, the newly diagnosed friend to the appointment. Because a lot of times when you get that new cancer diagnosis, it's very overwhelming. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There's so many technical terms and so many decisions to be made. And it'd be hard to even ask questions, you know? And so if that would be my big recommendation is just see if offer, if they would want you to go with them to the appointment. Yeah, yes, somebody to lean on. Suggestion. Yeah, sure. all right, so the eclipse coming up on Monday. Right. 
What happens if you look into the eclipse without proper protection? Yeah, so you can get permanent eye damage, actually. There's a couple things that could happen. One is you look into it, you can get a sunburn kind of on the outside lining of your eye, but you can get retinal damage that can be permanent, even cause blindness. Mm. So the recommendation is to use ISO certified, it's ISO 12312-2 certified <laughs> glasses or viewers, sunglasses aren't enough. They're just not strong enough. If you can't get those kind of viewers, there are, um, actually, if you, you just go to the internet and you Google um, projector box, NASA, there's instructions with cardboard, aluminum foil, paper, and a pen, uh, like a tack pen that you can create your own box for this. And one other thing I'd point out is, um, you, even if you have on the correct glasses and you're looking through an optical viewer, like a telescope or a binoculars, that those optics can intensify the rays and it can go through those viewers and still damage your eyes. So you actually need a special filter on the end of the optical device. Ah, okay. Yeah. And so symptoms to look for if you, do have, if you do get exposed during the eclipse would be blurry vision, feeling like grittiness in your eyes, white spots, headaches, those sorts of things. Okay, I know our Sarah Spivey has created one of those pinhole projectors. I think mm -hmm. she's got a how-to video on yes. our website. Yeah. They're actually pretty fun and super easy to make. So yeah. Yeah. that's an option. And if you can get your hands on the K-Set Eclipse glasses, they yes. are uh, all those things that I guess you told so us about. The two dash three something or other. <laughs> you got yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Cobb, thank you. My pleasure, thank I appreciate you. Thanks for having me. All right, we want to show you the QR code now. If you have questions for our group of doctors, we would love to ask them. Thursdays at 630, it's Doc Talk. Hit this QR code to submit a question you have. We'll be right back. Beautiful day across our area today. I stepped outside for a little bit and that wind was knocking all the pollen out of the trees. Yeah. Down into your hair. Oh yeah. But the fact that the humidity is low. Oh, it was wonderful to be out there. Yeah, there's Just had it's, to pick out the little dangly yeah. the, the hair. The catkins, the little the catkins. Yeah. <laughs> we call them the little dangly dingly things. Um, and also the little inchworms, they're out again now. They're they're coming down from those uh, from those oak trees, and they're not as thick as what we've had in recent history. Remember, there's one year, just a handful of years ago, where it was unbelievable. That was an anomaly, but anyway, you'll notice those too, little inchworms. Welcome, inchworms. 86 degrees right now, 76 at nine o'clock. By midnight, we're at 66, and tomorrow morning, we start the day at 53. More on what it would look like if cloudy during the eclipse, updated timeline for when areas will be in totality and for how long, and of course, the cloud forecast in this event. All right, and all the hustle and bustle, we almost lost track of what today is. You what? did. Today We almost, is. well, yeah, I know you wouldn't because Me. it's Thermometer Thursday. Yes, and I have the commemorative Thermometer winner. We're going to go over that in just a bit, but first I want to get to our rain chances and our newest drought monitor that's in. Then we're going to talk more eclipse uh, totality times and more in just a bit, but let's get right to our rain chances. Saturday it's at 20% and we, we're going to have some morning fog and drizzle and morning dampness and then Saturday night a 20% chance of a shower. Monday after the eclipse we're at 30% for some storms that could even become strong to severe. So keep that in mind as you're leaving your eclipse site. By Tuesday and Wednesday, Tuesday into Wednesday, some scattered activity. That's our most likely time frame. When we'll, I think we're most likely to have more numerous showers and storms and even possibly severe. It's that time of year. Our rain often comes at a cost in terms of potential wind and hail. Drought monitor, newest drought monitors in. Still not good for San Antonio, Bear County, and especially into the hill country where we have the extreme drought. It's not getting any better there, but hopefully by next week we'll get some heavy rain from some of those storms. And we really have some of the worst drought and most widespread drought anywhere of anywhere in the state, hill country and all the way down to Highway 90. 25 percent of Texas is in drought and a good chunk of that 25 percent is right here and also West Texas. Overall generalized rainfall potential finally starting to creep its way into more parts of Texas, especially, of course, East Texas, they're always, they've been getting it for several months, but finally we're starting to get into more of that potential and you saw those 40% chances as we get into next week. So let's start with tomorrow, sunny 85, 
Drizzle and morning fog, low ceilings all day on Saturday. Sunday's the better day for the air show, Valero Texas Open, sunny 85, low humidity. Monday, we're still expecting a decent amount of clouds, but I still am confident that we will have parts of our area that will still be able to see the eclipse. Now this came in from one of our KSAT viewers, Heather Schmitz, and this was in 2017 over Cortland, Nebraska. Notice significant cloud cover. This is during totality. So still an impact, which is pretty cool, right? It still gets really dark outside. It just gets super dark, super quick. What we're watching for high clouds, pretty much a guarantee. The question is how many, how layered are they going to be? Often they're thin and translucent, but not always. When exactly will our low clouds clear out? That's another question. We're going to have that low morning stratus as we often see with humidity this time of year and Unfortunately, it's too soon for those exact hour by hour forecasts. But as we get into the weekend, we'll have a better idea. Partially blocked eclipse. We still have the viewing at 60% chance of that and a, just a 40% chance of a totally blocked viewing of the eclipse. I want to talk. We explained about why, but let's take a look at some of the times of totality. This is actually moments after this. You can take your glasses off if you know what you're doing. Go to our website for more information. Stone Oak, parts of Stone Oak, 1.33 p.m. and 37 seconds. It depends. It, it really hinges even on the seconds. So you want to wait a good amount of time after that. But even around Castle Hills, totality lasting one minute and seven seconds. SeaWorld, totality, tot <laughs> totality lasting a minute or at, at two minutes in five seconds. So we've got more of these on our website for other parts of our area. All right, we know what time it is. There it is. <laughs> All right, so this is not just your ordinary thermometer that I make. This is the commemorative total solar eclipse thermometer, one of a kind, technically two of a kind. I made two, but the other one is going to the, the kind folks who are uh, boarding us up in Fredericksburg for the total eclipse. Nice. So this is the only one being given away to our lucky KSAT viewer. And the computer just picked the name for this commemorative homemade thermometer. Maria DeVault of San Antonio. Maria, I'm gonna send you an email very shortly with all the information and everything, but congratulations, you won the commemorative total solar eclipse thermometer. And that backboard, this backboard, um, this isn't stained. This is actually the color of the wood, so it's very unique and uh, oh, that's and cool. beautiful. Yeah, I, I don't use stains. I, li I let the wood speak for itself. <laughs> Go to ksat.com slash thermometer to enter the drawing. And next Thursday, I'm unveiling the Fiesta Metal. Nice. Mm. By the way, that's not just an eclipse thermometer. It's a cask eclipse thermometer. Oh, yeah, that's, that's pretty good. I'm going to blow glass during the eclipse so I can be the only person to ever be blowing glass to make a thermometer during a total solar eclipse. It's going to be awesome. Wow. That, does Guinness have that? We'll, we'll be right back. It will now. We don't know. <laughs> To the buzz in the University of Iowa, getting ready to cheer on Caitlin Clark and the women's basketball team in the NCAA Final Four, but one dental student showing his support in a different way. Brian Ding created a mosaic of the superstar Clark out of Rubik's Cubes. Yeah, I see it. He planned out a pixelated image, and then 720 Rubik's Cubes later, his masterpiece was complete. Tomorrow, Iowa plays UConn and NC State plays South Carolina. The winners of those games will compete for the national championship on Sunday. Yep, just like a dental student brushing up on his Rubik's Cube. <laughs> A new job opportunity open for those who are nuts about peanuts. Hormel Foods is looking for three peanutters to chauffeur Mr. Peanut across America in that full time. The job runs from June 2024 to June 2025. Yeah, the company looking for college graduates with a bachelor's degree in marketing, communications, advertising or public relations. Potential applicants must have an appetite for adventure and a desire to travel. Anyone interest should interested should apply at BAPeanutter.com by April 14th. Time is running out. We'll be right back. 
Thanks for watching the news at 6. See you back here on the Night Beat at 10.